G'day ladies and gents and welcome to another episode of Backyard Mechanics brought to you again by Fulcrum Suspensions, the suspension specialists. Now what I'm discussing today doesn't have a lot to do with suspension but they're still going to help you out with any purchases you make off their website. Just follow the link down in the description there and there's a promotional code INTENSE15 and that's going to get you 15% off site wide. Now what are we looking at today? This empty desk doesn't tell you very much so magic. Hey there it is. Okay as you can see that's a whole lot of battery stuff. Deep cycle battery there, projected DC to DC solar charger, a dual battery extension kit and a whole load of accessories. So by looking at that some of you can already tell we're putting a second battery in something which is the vehicle next to me here. My old man's 150 series Prado he's just had that for a couple of months. Now this projector IntelliCharge DC slash solar charger is exactly the same one that I've got in my patrol to charge the third and fourth batteries. Yeah, I've got that many batteries. And I really like the thing. Uh, this comes in at, I believe it was a touch under $400 and it's 25 amp charger and it has the solar um, multi-point power tracking regulator built into it. So compared to other brands on the market, um, this is actually a really good price you'd be looking at over $600 for that same sort of capability in another brand. I've had it in mind for three months, so it does really well. Um, we've got the Century Deep Cycle Wet Cell battery here. Wet Cell because this battery is going under the bonnet of this Prado. The 150 Prado has a really nice spot that is made for a second battery. It's even got the same sort of tray layout on the bottom of it there. So that's going under the bonnet. We've got a battery clamp there. Got all the necessary fuses. cable lugs and over here this extension kit we're actually putting we're actually also putting a Anderson plug all the way from the main battery of the car to the back to power the camper trailer we've got so this uh, works out quite uh, effective cost wise to just um, nip the ends off that run the plug to the back so let's step away from the desk take you over here I'll show you the engine bay layer on the Prado talk about exactly where this stuff's all gonna go that's our spot right there. Now the main battery is over the other side in exactly the same position. And this has the same sort of base as the main battery does. It's just missing the little plastic tray that that battery sits in. It's even got the spots here where a uh, battery clamp tie down would go. So the only difference would be maybe you'd go to Toyota, you'd pay $80 for the plastic tray that they have in the bottom or you can purchase a dual battery tray kit. I had a look into these when we were purchasing all the parts to do this, um, this second battery. And in that kit, you get a battery tray which bolts into the bottom here. I think it maybe secures into a captive nut up here somewhere. And this air conditioning hose here, this is gonna be in the way a little bit. There's actually a, a bracket for that that mounts where the battery goes. So that um, battery tray kit comes with something to relocate that but it's a touch under 300 bucks. So what my old man's gonna do is knock up his own battery tray. Uh, for today, we're just gonna sit it down on that platform there and clamp it in place. And in the future, he's gonna knock up something with the welder and a bit of plate metal. So that's where the battery goes. And now you've got to put in some consideration to where the charger goes. So what have we got in this kit? Got some destructions charger itself all bound up in this piece of cardboard. Let's get rid of that. A little bit of heat shrink and some cable joiners, they might come in handy. A couple of cable tires, that's about it. Oops, that's gone forever. I briefly considered putting it behind the headlight there. It would have good airflow. It'd be a pain in the ass if you ever wanted to change your headlight globes. But instead, I've opted to go behind the airbox. Still nice and close to the battery. Battery's just here. You wanna try and minimize that uh, cable run to get rid of any voltage drop that might occur. Behind the airbox here, there's a, there's a bit of a plate and it's got 
two eight mil studs poking up. So what I can do is I can get some sheet metal and knock up just a little right angle bracket, bolt that down into the car and we'll have the charger sitting right there. I know some of you are gonna be looking at this thing and go, why put this $400 charger under your bonnet when you can put a $100 isolator switch and do the same thing? Well, it's not that simple anymore. If you own GQ Patrol, GU Patrol, 80 series, anything older than or maybe 2008, 2010, you're fine, you can go ahead, use your isolator for under the bonnet. Once you start getting past that, vehicles introduce things like variable voltage alternators and temperature compensated alternators, all that sort of thing. And what they do, it's mostly an emissions thing, right? They cut down the voltage if your battery doesn't need charge. And that's a problem because it might read that your main battery is all charged and good, cuts down that voltage, doesn't supply enough to charge a second battery. So your second battery is getting like 50% charge at best and it lasts a year before it dies from being undercharged. So this being a 2014 150 series Prado has one of these special alternators. You need this. Now, if you're doing a battery installation up the back of your car, like I've got in my patrol third and fourth batteries, or you've got a dual cab ute or something like that, you've got batteries in the back, you also need one of these. Because if you use one of those isolators, you get voltage drop. So you might have a healthy 14.4 volts up at your, um, at your main battery. By the time it gets to the cable run down the back of your car, it's dropped to like, let's say 12.9 volts. That's a healthy voltage to run your accessories, not a healthy voltage to charge a battery. So same deal, your battery's gonna suffer in the long term. These things compensate for all of that. On top of that, it deals with different battery chemistries. So flip it around, look at the front here. Gel, AGM, wet, or calcium. This one doesn't do lithium. You've got to buy a very expensive charger to do new lithium batteries. The projector instructions call for 8mm power cable. Well that there is 8mm twin core. Always keep yourself a Lecky Bits box like what I've got. This is actually an offcut from the, um, the camper build. So it's twin sheath, I'm just going to cut the sheathing off it and just use the positive wire from in there, that's all I need. And this part is where we are making the power run from the main battery over to the charger. I've got a maxi fuse here. 50 amps is what the um, instructions call for. You can use a circuit breaker or a fuse. Um, he's opted to go for maxi fuse because you can just pop it open and see if it's blowing. Whereas circuit breakers, they're a bit of a different technology. That's just old, simple, big old fuse. So we're gonna put a terminal on one end of that, connect it to the positive terminal. Probably gonna solder, I think. Solder the red cable onto there. Use lots of conduit and run it across to the other side. Quick soldering lesson. That's a 100 watt iron I've got there. I would not recommend less than probably 80 watts. And the tip to soldering is to crank it full of heat. Not enough to damage things, but enough to melt the solder. So what I'm doing there, I'm tinning the tip of the soldering iron. As you can see, it's a pretty damn old tip and then press lightly into your join, let the heat flow. Now what should happen is as you poke that solder in, oh, right in the face, it just flows into the join. See that? It's a nice hot solder join. If it turns out to be a cold solder join, the solder will just sit in like little bubbles on the surface. That's not what you want. This is just flowing all the way through the join. See how easy that solder wire is just pushing in? The soldering wire I'm using is probably a little bit too thin. So it's just gobbling it up real quick. And that there is a beautiful solder joint. It's flowed all the way through. 
nice, hey? When it comes to solder joins, you've got to protect them because moisture will get in that if you don't and it'll corrode the connection and then you start getting electrical gremlins. Nobody likes them. So because the uh, charger came with a little bit of heat shrink, I'm using that. Just slip heat shrink over the join. If you don't have heat shrink or you forgot to slip the heat shrink over the cables before you soldered them, a bit of electrical tape is better than nothing. And then to melt heat shrink, you can use a lighter if you like. It just leaves black stuff all over it. I've got a heat gun, so why not? Ooh, that's warm. All right, I've got to get that on there now, but the problem is way too small of a gauge. So it's perfectly acceptable to bend that over. And because a proper pair of crimps to crimp something that big is like a multi hundred dollar investment, There you go, flat as a tack, mate. And then just to make sure it's really secured, tighten it up a bit more. Go again. And there you go, it's crimped on there. It's not as pretty as what would be done by a professional set of crimpers, but it's nice and tight and that's what really matters. There you go, it's all wrapped up in conduit, all soldered up, all well protected, ready to connect to the battery. Make sure you leave the fuse holder empty at the moment, otherwise there could be death and fire and explosions. Maybe not, because the fuse would actually save you from that. But you don't need a fuse now anyway. Although it's protected in conduit, so the cable's not gonna rub through, you still wanna try and protect that as much as possible. Better safe than sorry, hey? So, all the way along, cable ties, let's go. <laughs> Time to talk about this Anderson plug. Now, what do we use the Anderson plug for? They're pretty much for trailers, exclusively for trailers. Uh, so off-road campers and all of that sort of thing with house batteries in them, um, they have their own charger in them, at least if it's done properly, they do. Our one has a Red Arc 20 amp um, DC to DC charger. Basically the same principle as this projector charger we're putting in. Uh, helps with the, the voltage drop over that massive run between the front of the car and a trailer. So this is literally just two high amperage wires that are gonna go from the main battery all the way back through to an Anderson plug at the back. We bought this thing from Super Cheap Auto called the Ridge Rider Dual Battery Extension Kit. And here's what we've got. We did the maths and it worked out cheaper to buy this seven meter long cable with Anderson plugs on both ends than it was gonna be to buy the cable in a different length and then buy Anderson plugs to go on the ends as well. So the plan is to cut one of these Anderson plugs off, put two ring terminals on the wires that are left, and put this fuse in there as well. If you're not sure about fuses, always start lower rather than go high, because say that's capable of carrying 60 amps, but you're not sure, and you put a 100 amp fuse in there, your fuse stays fine, doesn't blow, your wire melts and starts a fire anyway, so always start with a lower fuse. There it is, run up to the front. And what you do when you're doing a cable run along the bottom of a vehicle, try and tie it along existing wiring looms, uh, brake lines if you can find them, and failing all of that, you can go sometimes through the holes in the chassis. It's a bit tricky, it probably took me about half an hour, but you wanna get it nice and tight so it's not gonna wriggle around and cut through. Now I've got all this extra length, Remember, it's a twin core cable, so I want to come across to the negative terminal here and cut it at a length where it's still going to reach there. Just pull that conduit back for a moment. And then you want to pull away the outer sheathing. So now you've got two bare wires. We can cut this red one off back to a length that suits the positive terminal. And this one here, we can put a ring terminal on go straight to the battery. Now we've still got a solder on our fuse holder as well.
now that the Anderson plug is all in and connected, finally the bracket's all done and dried up, ready to mount that charger over there. So let's go back over that side and dig back into the more complicated fun bit. To make access easier here, I've pulled the airbox out. Two minute job, unless you need a 10 mil socket, then it's a 20 minute job because no one ever knows where that is. When you're doing wiring like this and you want to keep it neat, try and think about how many cable runs you're doing. So for example, this one here has to connect to the charger there. Now, if I cut this piece of conduit off a bit back further and put a thicker bit on there, I can run another cable along there to go up to the battery. I can also run that there, that temperature sensing wire, through the same bit of conduit. And instead of having what looks like a bunch of three different wires crammed up in here, I'm just gonna have one nice big thick piece of conduit. It's gonna look really neat. So I mentioned earlier we need to connect the blue wire to an ignition pickup. So if you connect this ignition wire to an ignition feed, something that is live only when your ignition is on, turning the ignition on will activate the charger. Turn the ignition off, you won't drain your battery overnight. Sorry about his banging. That's, uh, that's Dad making up the bracket to mount this. Now you don't have to do it if you don't have a uh, brand new alternator with variable voltage but it's not gonna do any harm in actually doing it. It's just gonna make sure this thing's only charging when the vehicle's running. So I'll show you quickly how to find that feed. Here I've got my Snap-on test light. The only piece of Snap-on equipment I own cost me 60, maybe 70 bucks, when you can probably pay $10 for a test light, but I needed to own me some Snap-on, and that's it. Now, all you need to do is connect this to a suitable earth point. Um, because I don't have this new battery hooked up yet to an earth, just anywhere on the body should do. And to test it, you can just tap it on your battery terminal. Again, that's not gonna do anything because this isn't hooked up. Tap it on your battery terminal, make sure it's lighting up, and that means you've got a good earth. Now we've got to go in the car, switch the ignition on. And now you just start stabbing away at your wiring like it's been talking bad about your mother. Ooh, see that? That's lit up already on that blue wire there. So I have no idea what this piece of the wiring loom does, but poke this in and I get red on my test light. Now to make sure that is ignition switched, we get someone to go in, turn the ignition on and off, and this should come on and off with it. And if that's the case, that's our wire to hook into. Look, I made another one of these. It's exactly the same as the one that runs from the main battery. Just a terminal on this end, big fuse holder here, soldered up in the middle there, and then this end here will be going to the output wire on our charger. Okay, let's go over this one more time, what I've hooked up here. So, external LED, don't need that. We'll just tape that up in the loom. The green one there, that's the solar power in. Not using the solar power feature on this charger at the moment, so we'll just tape that one into the loom. Which leaves us the blue wire, just down there. That's hooked up into our ignition feed. This red one here alternator in. So that's the wire that's come from our main battery positive into the charger. Brown one here, that's auxiliary battery out. So that's coming out of the charger through this red wire and off that way to the positive battery terminal on our second battery. This black one here, that is an earth for the charger. And that goes to our auxiliary second battery. And then this little black wire here is the temperature sensor so that this charger can compensate its charging if the battery there gets too hot. Now that that's all done, we're gonna tape all of this up and put some conduit around it nice and neat. I found this pre-made battery earth cable in my box of electrical bits and goodies. So I'll just one end on the battery, wrap it around, other end onto my earth point down there. Too easy.
It's finally all wired up. Have a look at that, how neat. Charger over there on this little bracket. All the wires in this fat loom here. Then they go down that way. Got this big one here, comes up to the negative. And then that one that goes across and up to the positive terminal. So all that's left to do before I try this thing out is tighten down those two battery terminals, whack a fuse in here and a fuse in the other side. And then when we turn the car on, we should see the proper lights come up on here. So both the fuses are in. Now we've got to set this charger. Default setting, there you go, is AGM. But we have a wet battery. So on the projector charger, you hold that mode button for four seconds. Things start flashing. Skip across to wet there, and then you let it go. And that's programmed it for a wet cell battery. A battery's resting voltage is about 12.9 volts, so by hooking up a multimeter, we can see if it's charging or not. 14.72 volts, healthy charge. So there you go, the 150 Prado has got a second battery now. Really, these advanced chargers aren't as bad as they look. They're a little bit scary maybe for those of us that are used to the, the big old solenoid with two wires going in, but you give yourself enough time, make sure you take your time with your wiring, keep flipping through the instruction manual, and they're not so bad, and it's gonna give you way better charge in your battery, extend your battery life, and of course, work with these modern charging systems. Then we've got the Anderson plug over there, even easier again, anybody can do that for the sake of a fuse, a little bit of wiring and some Anderson plugs, and we're just finishing off the plug down the back. So thanks for watching Backyard Mechanics, I hope you found it informative, and if you wanna learn some more stuff about wiring, we'll be going through this with a 12 volt socket to power the angle later down the track. That's another nice easy job. It'll make for a good bit of footage for you. We'll see you next time on Backyard Mechanic.